Joyce Carol Oates' 1966 story seems to cause many different interpretations among scholars. Obviously, it seems to reflect something of the times, what with the hippie movement going on, but exactly how is kind of unclear. Some scholars, such as A.R. Coulthard, accuse her of straight-up plagiarizing story from the Times documenting the murder of three young girls by Charles Schmidt, particularly of Wendy Fritz here, the third of them. D.F. Hurley, on the other hand, suggests Coulthard is stretching some of the details and instead advocates for more of a dream theory. Many scholars also give a lot of attention to the famous numbers and what they mean. This is a story with a lot of strong symbolism. So Wesley and I wish to dive into scholarship, which focuses on some of the effects that this might have and some of the ways that meaning can be constructed from this text in Joyce Carol Oates' Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? Now, for an overview, we'll be going over a discussion of space and the role containment plays first, then move on to the way text depicts female oppression and associated myths, and then coming around in the end to a discussion of how Connie's psyche might be interpreted in the conflict, what the song might represent, and what takeaways we might find. So first, let's talk about space and containment in the story. We see throughout the story that a large struggle is Connie, who is inside of the house, and Arnold Friend, who is outside, trying to coax her into his car and into the public space. The house keeps Connie in a sterile existence inside, while, on the other hand, she finds sexuality and fun outside. You can see this at the beginning in some of the descriptions of her parents' lives versus the life with her friends running around with boys and such. James Cruz, in particular, uh, talks about the struggle of containment and boundaries in Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been in Cold War Hermeneutics, in which he outlines the problem during the Cold War, that the ideal citizen was one swept away by Cold War rhetoric, who ultimately abided in ignorance. In this essay, he talks about women's role in all of this, and how they have a duplicitous role of having to contain everything within the home, having to maintain order, yet also having to provide sex for men, having to be this kind of seductress. And so we see this evident when the mother, after Connie comes home, has to question her about her friend who Connie calls dope at one point. Um, but this suggests the fragility of this whole border and the notion of trying to contain Connie's morality within the home and her character. This moves on to a lot of discussion about female oppression in the story. The public space is controlled by men in the traditional formulation of these kinds of different spaces. G.J. Weinberger in Who is Arnold Friend, The Other Self, and Joyce Carol Oates, Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been, talks about how women are not allowed power and autonomy in the public space. Basically, how it used to be is that a woman would have to be accompanied by a man through the public space or they'd be considered innocuous like a prostitute or something of course the internal space of the home is not connie's to be controlled either it is a space controlled by the morality of her father the control of her mother who's just bending to the father's morality both spaces are controlled by men and connie doesn't have a space to be herself and so this exchange of connie going from the house to the outside space with arnold's friend kind of represents an exchange from one form of patriarchal order to another one, just to another oppressive man. In this sense, we also get a lot of mythic codification with this story, particularly to the Death and the Maiden myth. Martha Widmeyer compares the story to Death and the Maiden inscriptions and paintings in her article, Death and the Maiden, Joyce Carol Oates, Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been? A working title of Joyce Carol Oates' story was originally Death and the Maiden, to make it quite unsubtle what the connection is here. Basically how the story goes is you'll usually have a woman who is dancing, who is supposedly rather vain, looking into a mirror, brushing her hair, something like that, and then Death appears appears and tells her that she must join him and she dies. To get into it, let's read one of the Death and the Maiden poems. Death to the Maiden. Maiden, your lips so fresh and red, must with paleness overspread. You danced with boys, enjoying glee, now comes the time to dance with me. The maiden's reply, alas, thy dead hand holds me fast, my mirth and joy are all now past, no more in dance, I'll take delight, to all I say, a long good night. The connotation of the death and the maiden myths are rather sexual. Um, the notion of the jouissance is uh, a kind of union of death and sex both. This obviously applies to the story as Arnold Friend would have to represent this archetypal figure of death. He wants to have sexual union with Connie. Um, she's being lured to her death. However, 
the article points out that Oates gives Connie more choice in this situation and a possible chance for redemption, having to sacrifice herself for her family in a form of heroism instead of just dying. Widmeyer writes, Goodwin writes that the moment of judgment is implicit in nearly all the early dances of death and brings with it the Christian temporal and typological framework. Read within this framework, Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been, is a less terrifying tale of death than a story of redemption. Connie is unprepared for the sudden appearance of death, but where she is going may well depend upon where she has been. Given the chance to ready her soul, she goes to the grave accompanied by her good deed. Therefore, in a little bit of a different interpretation, G.J. Weinberger suggests that Arnold Friend is meant to play the role of Connie's doppelganger, her other self, representing aspects of her own desire and how she wishes for the ability to live beyond various social orders, such as those of her parents, the police, and the light, immature nature of young sexuality, as Arnold Friend is able to do. Arnold seems desirable to Connie, yet creates this fear for her, enforcing this mix-up between the self and the desire for becoming this other idealization of the self. It seems to represent a metaphor for the disillusionment of growing up as this other self is grotesque in comparison with herself it has to be represented as male because men dominate the public space it has to be represented as this kind of fraud figure it seems like it's not a very positive image for connie to grow up to try to be this seems to represent her disillusionment with having to grow up and incorporate herself in this patriarchal societal kind of order either she becomes like her older sister and gets a job attempts to find motherhood eventually in her own household to take care of under a male control or she goes with arnold and joins the counterculture movement also dominated by the male order in spite of whatever the sexual revolution was supposed to have meant at the time it still fetishized women and kept them within these madonna whore type expectations and constructs connie really has no escape she is killed either way by male control be it hippie power serial killers or her own father slash husband oppressing her and keeping her in the house Alongside the ultimate self-theory, there are those who suggest mythological approaches to the story. We find explanations of Arnold as Satan, a satyr, or a parody of Prince Charming, each providing a different reading of the character of Connie in this story. Joyce Weggs conceptualizes Arnold as a symbolic Satan, who also functions on a psychological level. This comes from an understanding of Oss's religious views and elements in the story. It understands the incongruities in Arnold's appearance as a result of being Satan and the physical differences that'll come from that, including the instability in the boots and stuff. It specifically mentions horned feet and things like that. It also portrays him as a grotesque parody of pop culture meant to trap Connie. Christian concepts of Satan suggest that this leads to a reading of Connie as a sinner corrupted by Satan, that she reasonably should have known better than to fall for Arnold's routine, since in Christianity, humans may be corrupted by Satan, but they're still held accountable for their sins. This understanding is directly disputed in, for example, J.G. Weinberger's article discussing Arnold as the other self, mentioning Wegg's article by name. Easterly, on the other hand, conceptualizes Arnold as a satyr. His use of music and some signs matches with the way that they're described as enchanting many of their victims through songs or through other symbols, preying on young women in that way. Some of his aggression also matches the satyr's tendency toward violence in their in their attempt at sexuality when they pursue the nymphs that they pursue. And Connie is conceptualized as one of these nymphs, first enchanted and then crippled by fear when the aggression comes through. This leads to a much more sympathetic reading of Connie as a trapped, enchanted victim rather than as a corrupted sinner who has a level of agency left in the situation. In a slightly different approach to the mythological understanding of this, Stan Kozakowski conceptualizes Arnold as kind of an inversion and perversion of Prince Charming and Connie as Cinderella. He cites similarities in Arnold's approach to Connie as to the approach of Prince Charming, similar levels of infatuation and other things like that, and also explains the way that he's a parody through his kind of grotesque features, the way that he has some kind of face mask and is unstable in his boots. From the article, Connie, of course, though barely beyond childhood, suggests some kind of fakery and suspects that Arnold is neither princely nor youthful. He is, we will discover, a complexly fantastic creature of wholly different composition. He is a representation of what Connie looked for in youth culture, but kind of a subverted, horrifying one. He also conceptualizes Connie as an analog to Cinderella, explaining her as pretty blonde-haired, good-natured, but very uncomfortable, beleggered, and neglected. 
explaining her lifestyle as having a lot of parallels with Cinderella's, with a mean-spirited complaining mother, an absent father, and difficult and preferred older sibling. This understanding of her leads to a little bit more of a complicated role than the other two, because she's still victimized by the counterfeit Prince Charming that Arnold represents, but she also had more of an active and interested role in seeking this, and just thought she was getting something other than what turned out that she was. On the other hand, James Cruz in that previous article identifies the problem of the confining nature of her space as making it impossible for her to recognize and identify external threats. She's not sure whether Arnold really is a friend or if she's someone trying to kill her, for example. When she follows Arnold at the end of the story, she notes that she was hollow with what had been fear, but what was now just an emptiness. Cruz then elaborates on this quote. At what point was her hollowness merely fear? Five minutes or five years ago? The story does not say. Nor is she, or are we, the readers, to know. We cannot begin to explain why Connie must suffer as she does, or to fit her punishment to a crime that eludes us. All we can do is watch and wonder whether our forms of surveillance have been adequate. In talking about this, we realize that Connie's own troubles of recognizing certain boundaries and lines of containment aren't just hers alone, but ours as we try to interpret the story and are unable to latch onto these symbols with a discrete, definite meaning. The story leaves the reader many questions, but ultimately nothing can determine a reading outside what the reader wishes to recognize. In her article, uh, Connie Turns 50, Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? as Postmodern Experience, Nancy Barndes says, Richard Rorty advises readers to think of literature not as a path to the truth, but as a tool to help them get what they want. The cultural moment at which we encounter this story influences what we infer as Oates' meaning. Obviously, there's many ways to interpret this story. There's many weird details that you can pick out to come up with whatever kind of meaning you want, but ultimately, these kind of interpretations that we place on Connie's story represent more of ourselves than the story itself, as the story is more of this crossing point of anxieties and the nature of containment and societal structures. We know what happens in the story, but to then extrapolate that and apply overly specific meanings to all of these symbols seems to do a text a huge disservice, rather representing our own attempts to quell the anxieties that this text brings about. To finish off, I want to quote Cruz once again. Oates indicated in accepting the National Book Award, the use of language is all we have to pit against death and silence. The problem of containment is best solved not by more containment, but no containment. Well, that's all, everybody. Thank you for listening to our presentation. We have our outline here, but it's a little out of order. And now we have some questions for you. Um, what is a possible interpretation for the story that you find compelling and why? Is it allegory? Is it simply a realist serial killer story? Is it a dream? Tell us. Are you convinced by the dichotomy of pace and space and power in this story? For example, that all space is controlled by men, women are confined to the household, Connie's rebellious dancing and seeing boys in public still confines her to male judgment, etc. If yes, what do you think Oates is saying with Connie's various reactions to this power? If not, how do you think space and gendered power behave differently and why? Scholars often focus on mythic structures in this story. Death and the Maiden, Christianity and Satan, Cinderella, the Satyr. Do you think Oates merely reproduces the archetypes of these myths, or do you see anything she does to subvert some of these myths? In other words, how do you think Oates utilizes myth to bring out her concerns and themes? What do you think Arnold's friend's character is supposed to be? Is he a figure of evil and death? Is he Connie's own projection of self and desire? Even if he's just some serial killer, what do you make of how he's presented? Stuff like age discrepancies, rock style, clothes, his demanding nature. What do you think he does to Connie after the story ends? We talk near the end a good deal about the inability for both Connie and ourselves to interpret signs and symbols in the story, arguing it is a product of spatial confinement. How does that confinement apply to the readers, if it does? Is there any way the reader is confined while trying to interpret the text? Um, thank you. Have a good night.